Um, hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm uh, your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my very special guest, Banquet. Hey, Lisa. Welcome to Scorpio Season. Glad to have you on the show as usual. <laughs> so, <laughs> today we are doing the letter X, right? Mm, that's right, yeah. And uh, I sort of dared you to one-up me on an X max. So what do you have? Okay, yeah. Um, so I kind of went with a Brazilian joke. Um, I have a cheese burger. Okay, what is that? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> So in Portuguese, it's a cheeseburger. They spell X burger because the letter oh. X sounds like cheese. Um, okay. So it's a, and I also have a, a dos equis. Okay, both are kind of like borderline, don't you think? There's an X X <laughs> there, but okay, I'll give you both. No, uh, mine literally, literally name is two X's. Yeah, but the brand name is dos equis, right? So, but okay, yeah, you get. Mean, Two X's. It means two X's. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess that works. All right. So um, it's it's sort of a meaning and pointing thing, right? The English uh, D O S uh, at least kind of points to the two X's, right? For some reason, I thought it meant two horses. I think equals horse or something. All right, uh, my snacks. So not in I think that's not in that thing. Two horses, not, not, it might be, but not in Spanish. Does it keep okay. that? Be? Yeah. All right. So my mistake then. All right. I have two. Uh, are you actually going to eat that whole burger and fries while we talk? No, I'm going to have like a bite of it. Okay. Because that would be, I'd have to talk a lot. All right. My first X snack is this thing called Xyli Chu. And even though it sounds like a brand name, it's apparently this artificial or natural sweetener called birch xylitol. And xylitol. Yeah, so yeah. I've never heard of it. So, oh, we uh, should put it on the list to talk about. We should talk about xylitol. Oh, you I know something about, about it? Xylitol. All right. I have a whole xylitol story, yes. Um, All right, we will talk about xylitol then. And my other one, this is kind of a cheat, I think. This is, uh, I guess, a brand name. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that. X-O-C-H-I-T-L. No, they have it right underneath it. It's so cheetol. Oh, so cheeto. So cheeto. Okay. Okay, so I have two X snacks. One is sort of a brand name slash ingredient, and the other is a brand name. Right. This is, cheeseburger is not a brand name. It's okay, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Yeah, linguistic switching is uh, kind of an interesting way to win language games. I mean, it's spelled in English letters. Yeah. I have to say, the first time I went to a burger joint in Brazil, I was very confused about <laughs> what people were ordering exactly. I'm going to actually try the xylitol gum and then like, probably take it out because I'm not actually a gum chewer. Do you chew gum much? No, it hurts my jaw. You got something on your lip there. I know. <laughs> All right. The perils of eating on a show. I brought napkins. It's okay. I'm, I'm prepared for this. <laughs> All right. Mm. This just tastes like normal chewing gum. It's a little different kind of sweetener, but mm. okay. Mm. All right. So what are we talking about today? Great. So today, again, letter X, uh, the first thing we have up on the list is Xerox. Hmm. Um, so my one real job. Oh, is this, wait. So this is your one real, you only ever had one real job? Well, two. The first one was actually in Austin in Texas. Um, mm, in okay. the middle of my grad school, I took a year off after I did my qualifiers and went and worked for a company for a year. Uh, but that, I don't really count that because that was a startup and the founders wanted me on board and it wasn't like a true job experience. Like I was there, I was the first employee and sort of helping Bro, set up that, the office no, and stuff. Not, yeah, so that's, that's not, not a real job, no. I mean, I did a lot of work, but it was not a regular that's, job. That's not a real job. That's <laughs> not like, no. All right, so, uh, and I don't count things like, you know, grad school teaching assistant and stuff or uh, even the the postdoc was kind of a real job because you do research and stuff but you're like it's like phd plus plus extra time to hang around and do shit so even the postdoc is not really a job so my only real job is 2006 uh, august to 2011 was it yeah 2011 march so five years i was at um, xerox so four That's and a half a long time. yeah okay. 
So Xerox, uh, what are my thoughts about Xerox? I learned a lot about uh, printing. I was uh, originally hired onto the uh, print hardware group as a control engineer. So like, you know, the control software and circuitry for driving print engines. And I quickly realized that uh, that future was like deader than a dodo. I should think of a better cliche for that. But so I spent like six months uh, doing basically modeling of print hardware and how to like design new control systems and stuff like that. Then applied for an internal grant that they were running kind of a incubator thing inside for, so I was in the R&D division as a research scientist and they had like an incubator program for small grants to do little startup-y things. So I applied for that, got it. So I was in the first cohort when they started that program. And effectively I did two internal startups. And one was kind of a consumer web social bookmarking type thing that lasted like a year or two and then kind of died. The other one was like a auction marketplace uh, for enterprises that uh, was launched internally. I think it survived for a couple of years, then that too was kind of shelved. So that's my sort of entrepreneurial experiences at Xerox. But I had a lot of fun. I was like uh, living in Rochester for several years, then I moved remote to DC. And Xerox is a good company. I mean, it's, um, it's of course got a very storied past. It was like the first unicorn, actually, it was the first company to hit a billion dollars, uh, uh, I think in the 60s. Uh, like the first Xerox. Um, copier, the model 916 or was it 914? It kind of, so the, the, the story is actually really interesting. So the copier was invented by a guy named Chester Carlson and there's a great book called Copies in um, Seconds. And he was like a literal cartoon inventor. Like he set out one day and said, I'm going to be an inventor and I'm going to fill notebooks and notebooks with ideas of things I could invent. And it was like just a systematic process of like just looking for inventions. like. Edison style, but much more cartoonish. And the thing he came up with couldn't have been like accidentally discovered in the process of doing something else or something like that. Like literally it was an obscure digging through libraries, discovering that the element selenium had particular sort of photoreceptor properties, like it was light sensitive. And then like coming up with this Rube Goldberg contraption to arrange elements so that you could use the photosensitivity of selenium to create copies. And that was the Xerox copying process. And he talked to an academic, so eventually a company in Rochester called Haloid, which at that time made photographic film. It was across town from uh, Kodak. So they made photographic film. Um, it was kind of not a very successful, it was a small company. They bought, they took a bet on uh, Carlson basically and bought his process and brought him on board and mm -hmm. uh, created the first copier. And a professor at the University of Rochester, I think suggested they should name it Xerography. So xerography is, uh, I think, Greek for light writing. So writing with light, because mm -hmm. you're, you're essentially using light to do it. And that's, that's cool. kind of how the copier got uh, started. And uh, the interesting, slightly sort of petty thing the rest of the industry did is uh, nobody else calls it uh, xerography. Like the moment the patents expired in like seven or eight years um, and uh, other companies like HP and Canon and others got into the game, uh, in the literature, in the academic literature publishing about advances, they started calling it electrophotography. So oh. they, they wouldn't call it xerography because it would give the brand too much uh, sort of, uh, you know, boosting, That's right? Sort of, I see. And Xerox, if um, you think about it, it was one of the most famous brands to turn into sort of a common word, right? Like yeah. Xeroxing something. And if you go to like, uh, the developing world now, like in India, if you walk around, you'll see Xerox shops. It's the, it's the name for the generic, even though most same of them are not running Xerox machines. Yeah, it's same in Brazil. Like, you know, I would get, it took me a while to figure out what people were talking about. Same with the cheeseburger, but because um, it doesn't <laughs> sound like Xerox, they talk about Xeroxing. Like at the university, <laughs> they're like, you didn't buy textbooks, you just went and got Xeroxes. I'm like, exactly. What are we doing? Okay, but yeah. 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 A big thing. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I should give people like um, the full one minute uh, version of the Xerox story. So they invented Xerography at some point there was like antitrust legislation. They became a billion dollar company, but then the patents expired and other companies got in on the act. And they also started panicking about the you know death of paper and what would happen to the company if paper went away. So that's why they founded Park, And Park became the lab where like, um, I would say a huge chapter of personal computing was invented. Like it started with like SRI and Doug Engelbart and like work at DARPA. 
but a big, big chunk of the work of like going from the initial starting points of SRI and DARPA was done at PARC. And that's how we ended up with the PC revolution. And there's two really good books about that. One is called Fumbling the Future, which kind of is like a critical book about how Xerox basically invented all this stuff, but then basically gained nothing from most of it. Like 99% of the inventions went away and other companies made money off it. And the other a more sympathetic account, which is also more accurate, is called uh, Dealers of Lightning. Both are like excellent, so three books, uh, Copies and Seconds, uh, Dealers of Lightning and Fumbling the Future. Like a great sort of, uh, I don't know, object lesson in innovation and business and how these things uh, happen. And uh, yeah, Park, in the 80s kind of went into the decline then Xerox kind of had a resurgence uh, when they invented print on demand. So instead of like the office size copiers, like the huge production scale machines, they look like um, Heidelberg presses. They're like room sized if you've ever gone into a big print shop. And these are how you do print on demand these days. Like, you know, the it prints one copy at a time. It looks offset quality, can be full color, all that stuff. And that basically brought Xerox back from the brink of like, the ruin and created it, it, gave it like a whole new lease on life. Mm -hmm. And then in 2000, it had like a huge amount of like corruption and sort of, you know, top level scandal stuff, uh, stop mm -hmm. option scam kind of stuff. Then uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it got turned around and Mulcahy was the CEO then. And uh, it kind of like struggled along. But at that time, it had become clear that paper wasn't up on its way out. They did a big acquisition of a company called ACS and tried to like grow into services. And then uh, Carl Icahn and active uh, shareholders basically made them reverse that step. So uh, it, it went from like a $16 billion company to I think 24 billion, then back to like 12 or 13 billion. So they had to buy, acquire and get rid of the company. And eventually, I think the end game is a couple of years back, I think now, uh, Fuji Xerox, which was once a subsidiary of Xerox in uh, Japan, bought Xerox. So now Xerox okay. is uh, owned by Fuji. So it's a so very uh, it's yeah, like, nice 50 year story, like 50, 60 year story of like an important company and its history. So that's my Xerox story. I had a good time there. Good place. Good. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. That's fun. All right. So what are we talking about next? Uh, next, we have Xylitol on the list. <laughs> All right, so I am chewing xylitol gum, but I know yeah, nothing about it. Gum. So yeah, tell me your xylitol story. Now that you will, now that you've been chewing on it for a few minutes, do you have any like secondary impressions? Did it lose its flavor? Is it still sweet? Like, uh... it's a slightly different kind of sweet than I guess cane sugar or um, any of the other artificial sweetness. Sweetness, but otherwise, this is just chewing gum. I don't chew gum much, but this is just chewing gum. Okay, so here's the thing about like, so you call it an artificial sweetener. Um, but it's actually my understanding. I'd have to like, it's been a while since I, so I, so a while ago, a couple of years ago, long time ago now, probably like 2011, I got really into alternative sweeteners. Um, I don't know if it's artificial because I believe that, uh, xylitol is a byproduct of like, you burn like, a it's like ash. It's like wood ash. You like burn. Oh, like okay. Yeah. The package says birch xylitol and it yeah. says, oh yeah, it says, we sweeten xylitol chew with birch xylitol extracted from sustainable U.S. forests. Right. So it's a okay. it's a byproduct of a woody tree, and I think they like burn it or some sort of like ash extraction process. There's some sort huh. of like extraction process. But does that still make it an artificial sweetener? I think the answer is no because it's not invented in a lab. No. Like beet sugar, you like get beets and then extract sugar from them. Cane sugar, you grow cane stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's a natural sugar, but it's not a sugar. It's a sweetener, right? It's not uh, in the sucrose family of uh, chemicals. Oh, anymore. that's a good point. I'm not actually sure on the exact classification there. That's not something I'm super up to speed on. Oh, sugar it's alcohols. It's called sugar alcohols. So it is okay. a sugar, but it's not sucrose or fructose or, or any of the normal sugars. Right. So sucrose is actually the 50-50 combination of fructose and glucose. Yeah. And so your body just breaks the weak bond between them. And they basically, so if you have like 100 grams of sucrose, when you digest it, it's basically 50 grams of glucose and 50 grams of fructose is how your body processes it. Um, so in 2011, I got really into anti-sugar stuff. Um, and the anti-sugar that I like went way out against was like cane, it was basically sucrose. So like cane sugar 
is sucrose that's like you know made from sugarcane and then i was also like anti high fructose corn syrup but that also has an exact 50 50 um thing same it's, it's basically sucrose i think i think it's sucrose anyways um and it all kind of started from this thing i watched by this doctor it's called dr lustig um he has this great i want to say hour hour and a half presentation that he did back in like 2010 or maybe before that um where he explains how sugar impacts your body um how it like it basically deadens your like something about your feedback with how hungry you are so like you never the get insulin uh, response uh, it would be the insulin response um, yeah that cycle right yeah but, like, yeah i watched that video the lustig video i watched it at some point it was kind of fun yeah so that's like i watched this video and it convinced me to give up like sugar like cane sugars and I, but i love okay so here's something that i don't think if you know me now, you may not know, is that I love baking. I like baking baked okay. goods. Is like, I'm so good at it too, let me tell you. Um, like I make, <laughs> which I, I can make like chocolate chip cookies and they're like, they're like, oh, how did these come out so good? I'm like, I have no idea, but they're the best thing I've ever like tasted. Um, and I'm like, it's just like I'm magically natural baker, if that makes sense. Um, so whenever I like stopped eating sugar, I went through this whole phase where I was trying to do non sugar cane sugar baking. Um, and so like, the whole the whole idea is to reduce the amount of fructose that you eat or consuming um so i like went and you can look up like things so agave actually is really bad for you if you're trying to avoid fructose yep. which is the thing you want to avoid um anyways but you can look up kind of which ones have which now if i make anything i usually make it usually make it with maple sugar i don't know if that's any better but it's a little bit sweeter so you technically you need less um <laughs> but I did, I made cookies with xylitol and they came out terrible. Like they melted in like a weird way. Cause like the problem with trying to make big goods with alternative sugars is that uh, the weight of the sugar is really important for kind of like giving you the right consistency. And then uh -huh. it heats up, like it has a certain like property. They don't melt as much. I don't know. Cooking with alternate sugars, it's very hard um, and not very satisfying. So I kind of huh. decided I was going to give up baking mostly for good. I mean, I do every once in a while, like, Thanksgiving and stuff. That's kind of interesting. Uh, like, uh, I, I think uh, we should talk about this at some point, but the <laughs> baker versus cook distinction is a big one. Like uh, in our household, my wife is the baker and she bakes a lot and I'm the cook. We both, I don't bake much at all. Uh, yeah. Like I might put something in a toaster oven and do that, but that's the limit of my baking. Uh, <laughs> but I cook a lot and I think uh, I'm more naturally a cook. And I think uh, the interesting difference is that um, cooking to me is like a very fast, you know, REPL loop. It's like a command line thing. Like you get feedback in seconds, whether your, you know, dish is working or not, it's burning or not. Whereas baking your experimental feedback loop cycle is like an entire like 40 minute bake or something. And it either comes out or not and you have to modify. So it's like open loop in real time, but closed loop in sort of the batch level. Whereas cooking is like closed loop in like the, second to second stuff so yeah uh, but that's interesting because the other stuff you do like programming and stuff it's uh, much more fast loop right i guess so i don't know i can't i don't know man i don't know i have no idea i don't no idea um I, well i mean uh, i'm always surprised you know. idea. like how often like when you're writing a piece of code how often do you like uh, i don't know Try to compile it or run a test with it or something. It really depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes I'm more of a baker with code than I am like a cook. Like I'll like spend a long time writing. I'll spend a couple of days like writing a big piece out and before I actually start running it. Um, okay. Like, yeah, that uh, makes sense. I think uh, but coding can go from like baking to cooking the whole range, right? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what I'm doing. Um, and then once I get into the point where I've got like a big structure and I'm trying to like test different parts of it, I don't know. Maybe other people have like more of test-driven development, which means they're running their code a lot faster. I like, mm -hmm. I like kind of getting it all out, like doing the whole big sketch and then going back and fixing things, testing things out. But that's just how I do things. I don't know. Um, hmm. Okay, so you gave up baking so, and xylitol is not a good baking sugar. That's it's okay. Way. I just think, I think you have to use it. I think it works better on like non cookies. <laughs> like okay. not when you're like waiting for like the certain, like, cause you know, you want your cookie to have like a certain consistency and rise and like volume. Um, and it like, it seems like it would be cause it's like when you get it, it looks a lot like sugar. It's white and see-through, but it's got a different like weight to it. Okay. Um, and it just doesn't cook the same. Yeah. Okay. 
fair enough. Yeah, that was it. Was a very disappointing kind of like life adventure. <laughs> though. It was like I man. am. Cu- oh, go ahead. No, I said I am curious to know what a sugar alcohol is, though. Like, if it's not sugar, but it's not like something like aspartame, what the hell is a sugar alcohol? So I, I'm gonna look that up afterwards. Maybe we can figure yeah. it out. Maybe okay. that's the reason your baking didn't come out because maybe the fact that it is some mix of sucrose, like glucose and fructose, is important for the chemistry of baking and sugar alcohol maybe doesn't fulfill that function. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, so like actually, it's kind of interesting. Like, so the history, there's like you know, history of sugars and American baking, and um, before. I don't know exactly how long ago, but a while ago, before basically they had all these big sugar plantations in the Caribbean, sugar was very expensive. Um, Or maybe even then, at some point it became very cheap in which a lot of um, sweets in the US and recipes switched over to sugar cane because it was was cheaper. But before that, it became super plentiful. Um, Most stuff, I think, in the United States used maple sugar or maple syrup as like its sweetener. So like supposedly old school recipes, American recipes will be like using maple sugar rather than cane sugar. But it's interesting how many things kind of like switch when ingredients um, switch. Like I heard like a I think a year or so ago, uh, a woman who writes for the Atlantic was tweeting about um, how in the South the everyday bread was cornbread and getting like biscuits was a treat and southern biscuits. She was like tweeting about that recipe for southern biscuits. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. yeah, that was like a super special Sunday treat, but normally you would eat cornbread. And I guess that's changed because now you can, if you wanted to, you could just make V to your default bread, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's to some extent we do live in like a little bit of like a, I don't know if monoculture is the right word for it, but, um, you know, like it went from, I feel like y- your food used to be a lot more regional, like what you could get in different parts of the world was like really a lot more um, constrained by geography, whereas yeah. now it's not so constrained by geography. Maybe for oh, yeah. better, the worst, I don't know. And in, I think the Americas, corn is actually a really good example of that because, um, and it actually fits our X team. Like uh, you've heard the word mixed metallization, right? So it's got a big X in it. So mixed yeah. metallization is the sort of alkalization process by which corn is actually rendered a, a complete carbohydrate or something like I forget how, but basically the Mesoamericans discovered it, the Aztecs and others, and okay. you need that. Otherwise, if you eat a lot of corn as your sort of your staple grain in your diet, it creates, uh, what is it, beriberi or one of those other sort of deficiency diseases. So mixed metallization sort of fixes it and makes it a complete nutrient. And that's how you get masa and other corn-based flours. So you need that. And that's a function of, um, because it was kind of the only real grain available in the Americas before Europeans came along, you had to make do. And to make do, you had to like figure out this complex process. And um, a buddy of mine, Vaughn, he studies like food history and he just wrote a book on um, that, uh, like, uh, oh, I should sort of, uh, boost that book it's i forget what it's called the uncertainty mindset yeah uncertainty mindset by one term he's a management researcher who looked at a, like a huge number of restaurants high-end restaurants and how they innovated their cuisines and menus and that's how he knows a lot about food and food history so he was the one who sort of explained this whole mixed metallization process to me but yeah so uh, Apparently, in the South, when Europeans first started eating corn in the U.S., they didn't understand this sort of process. And so they ended up with the deficiency diseases until they kind of figured out why the Native Americans were doing what they were doing. So, mm. yeah. And then, of course, um, other grains became available in the U.S. and uh, it, it was no longer a problem. And you can like, now eat like, you know, boiled corn or some other forms of corn that are not fixed for the deficiency. Hmm. That's cool. All right. That was fun. Cool. So should we move on to our next topic, which is also an X topic, but not at all related to food. Um, we have, I, have xy- I put xylophones on here. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about xylophones probably isn't for many, for the reason you would think I would want to talk about xylophones. Um, I want to talk about xylophones because it's usually the thing that's used to represent X in the alphabet. Like when you go to grade school. <laughs> And stuff um, like you know what is X? X is like it's like nine times out of ten it's going to be the xylophone, right? Um, yeah. Unless you're at like some like more advanced kindergarten that's got the X-ray, but um, I think 
most places xylophone which i think is kind of interesting because like like you know alphabet it's like i think it's i think xylophone's interesting because it's a representative of the it's like the representative candidate of the letter x um yep. as, like a, <laughs> as a top as like a object um which is kind of interesting to think about I don't know. I'm trying to think what is the letter X in uh, military call signs like, you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. I used to know that whole thing at some point, but I think they don't, is X xylophone there? I don't think so. I don't think Xmas, so. I think X might be Xmas there. I don't know. Yeah, I think X, X is it. I think so. Maybe I should look that up. But yeah, that's kind of interesting. I think, kind of. I, I, I think I've played with a xylophone as a kid, but I don't think I had one. Um, just to make sure I'm remembering correctly, it's the thing with like um, little um, stiff uh, rods or something of different length on a frame, and then you hit it right with little uh, hammers. Yeah, and they make noise. Um, it's like a t yeah. it's kind of like a keyboard. It's a keyboard of sorts, but um, it's yeah, it's kind of like a precursor sort of to a piano, except instead of strings and hammers, it's metal bars and mallets. What about dulcimers? Uh, so dulcimers are kind of in the same family, right? Uh, are they? You, like uh, at least the Indian version is called the santur, which is derived from the Persian version. And that's like, it looks like, uh, you know, uh, it looks like a, a xylophone a little bit. And it has like a, a hundred strings of different lengths all mm. stretched and it's played with a pair of hammer type things. Oh, I see. So, okay. but uh, Usually people compare it to a dulcimer. So a dulcimer is, I think, uh, mainly Hungarian and Eastern European. But yeah, there's a whole family of these instruments, I think. Yeah, I actually played a mellophone in high school. The mellophone okay. is a xylophone, but with wood bars. Very briefly, I was oh, a mellophone. Because okay. um, I... Uh, <laughs> You are multi-talented, okay. <laughs> no, I was terrible at it. I, they put me on like what was supposed to be the easy part and I never made it to practice and I'd show up at like, I'd, sh I'd only show up for like the games to play anyways and like hit the stuff. I was really bad at it, but I did, I mean, I did wait, okay. Wait, wait, so you were in the marching band? Yeah, I was in marching band. So the I problem was too. Was, yeah, except <laughs> I, I played the bassoon and bassoons don't march. So they made you find something in the percussion section to do. Okay. So normally, and most of the time, the bassoons would become were recruited to be the cymbal players. <laughs> uh, oh, which, God. like, you learn all kinds of, like, fancy, like, how to do in and out. Like, it's a lot of, like, show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Banging, and, like, you have to remember where to walk and stuff, which I'm not very good at. Um, but I also ran in track and field, and they, pra like, practiced at the same time. So I couldn't be a symbol because I didn't have the time to dedicate to it, but they couldn't let, the band couldn't let anyone not do marching. Um, so I still had to like go to all the football games and participate in marching in some way. And the like kind of, like if I played a normal instrument, I could have just learned the marching, like a clarinet. I could have learned like the clarinet part and like it wouldn't have been as, you know, like I could have still played the clarinet yeah. songs, but I couldn't play the bassoon because there was a bassoon song. So they ended up putting me in the pit and the pit guy, instead of sticking me on the triangle or something like that, was like, oh, go play like the mellophone. Um, <laughs> like, I, you know, I like show up probably like, okay, I'm just going to hit some things now. I can kind of do this. This is great. Not really. Yeah, it was terrible. I had a good time. Right. We get to like push him out onto the field and pull him back off. So you were... You were both a nerd and a jock. You ran track and yeah. you were in the band. Okay, that, that's yeah. kind of an interesting mix. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. My school had a really terrible, terrible marching band. Like India in general doesn't have like the kind of marching band con culture the US had. So uh, when I joined, I was initially uh, assigned the kettle drum and I was very pleased because that's what I wanted to learn. I was like, play the kettle drum. Okay. And yeah. uh, I, played for like two weeks then some new kids joined from another school and they had a couple of like drummers all like people who already knew drumming in there so they kicked me off drums and put me on the recorder so i ended up from like being one of the four like people trying to learn the kettle drums to one of the 10 people playing the recorder so that was <laughs> a, a demotion like a really yeah big you demotion. got really demoted there man <laughs> that's like uh yeah. Wait, so um, wait, someone who knew them showed up and they were like, oh, sorry, Ben Cat. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this was, I think it was even, yeah, so there's kind of a little bit of a gender bar thing here. So my school, I went to a boys school that was boys mm -hmm. until the 10th grade. And after okay. the 10th grade, so 11th and 12th grade, uh, girls were admitted as well. 
And where did they come from? There was a girls' school as well. So these are Catholic schools. I was at the Loyola uh, Boys' School, and there was like a Sacred Heart Convent School across town. So in the 11th and 12th grade, yeah, they became like co ed. So the girls joined from um, the girls' school. Uh, so I, was, I must have been like, a, I think, ninth grade when I was trying to like play the kettle drum, but the girls who joined were in 11th grade. And it was the girls who knew the, a couple of the girls knew how to play the kettle drum. And it was kind of like an interesting ego hit because uh, this was, by the way, one of the first few years when girls were admitted to the you know, high school for uh, college I prep. See. So, so not only are they showing up, they're kicking you off the kettle drums. Exactly. But, but there's more to it because there was sort of a status hierarchy when it was an all boys marching band and the drummers were at the top. So it was like drummers were the cool kids and then, you know, maybe it was the buglers and then recorders was at the bottom of the totem pole. And then these girls show up from across town and they play the drums and they kick me off the drum part. So that's kind of hilarious. I was kind of a little pissed for a while. But then I got yeah. You got super demoted, man. <laughs> Especially in an American hierarchy with like more instruments. I imagine there's like 10, 15 instruments and recorders at the very bottom. Oh, yeah. But where does a mellophone stand in the hierarchy of instruments? Also at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so we both suck at being band nerds. Yeah. Um. The other, like, the the real, like, the real cool, do- so, like, the real cool double reads, that was, like, bassoon and oboe who had to get integrated into percussion would get mm-hmm. really good at playing the drums. And then, so the cool percussion thing was, like, these four sets of drums that you would, like, wear and play. They were really cool. Um, <laughs> or, like, the bass drums were also pretty, like, cool. Uh, they like, cool They're dance. a little too basic. I mean, you can do, like, twirly stuff and other things. But uh, they're not like uh, percussion fancy, like the kettle drums, which yeah. you can do like much more fancy stuff, right? Are these yeah. like, right, exactly. So it's the fancy drummers were like the top of the percussion pecking order. I'm not really <laughs> sure anything outside of that because like it was a big enough school that you had like a bunch of people in percussion. So like you could just have like a social order inside of that like little group. Um, Pit was it? I was so like the mellophone is considered part of Pit, and it's all where like all the weirdos and like <laughs> semi untalented, semi uncoordinated kids end up. I fit right in. It was great. I had a great time in Pit. It was fun. Um, but yeah, it was definitely. Did you definitely- ever watch the movie Rushmore? No, I don't think so. You should watch it and we should talk about it um, at some point because it's about this kid. It was one of the, one of my favorite sort of um, learning what America is like movies. um, And Mm. uh, it's about this kid who's basically into like a huge number of extracurriculars and he's like, uh, uh, what's his name? Schwartzman. So he became famous later. But yeah. And so a a kind of like a banisticized version of uh, you actually, I would say. Like you're much more that kind of all over the extracurriculars than oh, me. I, I was, I'm that way a little bit, but not as much as you. I was all <laughs> of it. All I think I did like almost every extracurricular cur- curricular you could. Um, I did sports. Really? I did band. I did like academic competitions. I went to state in like the academic competitions. Uh, all right, anyway. let's compare lists then. Um, oh, okay. Okay, so uh, let me. Okay, so your list. Uh, let, let's do it systematically. So academic competitions where you went to state, you did track, you did band, um, yeah. what else? I don't know, what else is there, Venkat? Music, uh, like singing I or mean, something? I played in band. Okay, that comes with music as well. Okay, I think I might beat you in sheer number of activities, but not probably in quality or depth. So I was um, on the quiz team and um, sort of uh, rep- won a couple of trophies and went to regionals, I guess what you would oh, call wow. regionals in um, uh, the US. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, I went into some programming competition and again represented the school and kind of won like a special mention award at some regional thing. It doesn't mean oh, wow. much. The competition was very poor. Uh, I was deeply into astronomy and I think I was the vice president of the astronomy club and the president of the physics club. So this was like turning into an embarrassing list of like geekeries. Uh, and I think I tried to start an aero modeling club, so like, you know, building model airplane stuff. And it was just two of us kids who were really into it enough. So that wasn't really a club. And then I was in, I think, debate. And that was the, uh, so I was, I was in a total, of, I counted at one point, like uh, I was in 10 clubs of various sorts, but I would say four or five of them were kind of like just 
membership in name only they didn't do anything uh-huh. so five or yeah, six I, of them were active and uh, I was familiar with those people I was familiar with those kids <laughs> in school um yeah doing band in uh sports takes up a lot of your time so you can't do all the club things but I had friends that were in that circuit if that makes sense oh so sports, oh, at one point, I didn't do, yeah I didn't do sports in high school because I wasn't like good but I did get pretty good at swimming sort of later in high school and then joined the swim team in college so I have like, oh, sw- sports credentials in college but okay so that's my list uh okay I wasn't I, I can't explain anything more than more I was gonna say I did model UN at one point Briefly. Oh yeah, yeah. Super fun. That was that was actually a really good experience for figuring out how like parliamentary procedures and stuff like works. Like trying to get your like measures passed and like going behind scenes and making like alliances to get people to vote on your stuff. Like so, this is like uh, Robert's Rules of Order and things like that, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know, remember like the exact things, but it was like, it was like really cool because we got to go to the, it was like a field trip. You went to like the local like college and they had like a big plan. I wasn't in plenary because it was my first year. I only went one year. So I had to go to like one of the small, not as cool committees, like the plenary committee. But I had a friend who was Egypt and he made some really great speech that I heard about later. Um, (laughs) Oh, Uh, yeah. yeah. So did I guess I forgot a couple of other activities then. There's uh, public speaking and I, yeah, I did a lot of that too. I usually represented my class in like public speaking contests and there was, um, okay. uh, the last activity was, oh yeah, I, I mentioned this before, uh, theater and a drama. So like acting in and uh, scripting stuff. Yeah. Were you in that stuff, theater? No. When did you get into your opera singing stuff? When I was 26, so. Oh, okay. So, like, adult Late life, yeah, you know, stretch things out. All right, so watch Rushmore and we'll talk about Rushmore at some point because I kind yeah. of, I'm really thinking a lot about hobbies right now because I'm like getting back yeah, into a like midlife it. hobby crisis right now. I just got a telescope. I just got a 3D printer, which arrived today. So I'm going to be playing with 3D printers soon. And I just got an adapter for my iPhone to attach to the binoculars and telescope. So okay. I can now take better, like, you know, Astrophotograph, uh, astrophotographs. So I'm really getting in, and I'm building a clock, a model clock. So we should talk about clocks in the next time we come around at sea. Because you yeah, built let's your, talk about clocks. Yeah, moon clock, and I have a wooden pendulum clock. We'll compare clocks. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like we can do a clock show off. Clock competition. Yes, clock show off. Um, I feel like you're into competitions, then, Kat. Are you I'm sure into, you're into informal? I'm pretty sure you're not an introvert. Part of me is getting this like non-introvert uh, vibe from I, you. I think I've gotten more extroverted as I've gotten older, but I'm actually, if you've ever taken the detailed version of Myers-Briggs, they actually score you on subcomponents of uh, introversion. And I scored as um, expressive introvert. So expressivity is a sort of sub-factor in one of them. So mm-hmm. I show up as like strong introvert on most of the factors except expression so strong expressivity which means i guess i like to write and talk and stuff but in terms of like drawing energy from being around people and Uh, stuff no i'm definitely an introvert yeah uh, okay that makes sense no all that club and sort of uh, activities in high school kind of stuff Mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't call that extroversion that was like a a lot of alone time like tinkering with my own shit i I think a lot of uh, High school we did activity. attempt to recruit other people into your shit, I guess. The one time when I tried to start the airplane modeling yeah. club, but that was because I had two friends who already were kind of into it, and we thought we could maybe like uh, make it bigger and get uh, the school to pay for some of it, which we didn't. I'm familiar with this grift. Yep, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. yep. We did. We did get the school to pay for a few things, but uh, yeah. Well. Uh-huh. All right, all right, but nothing grifty. People enjoyed it. Okay, so what are we talking about next? Uh, let's see. Next, we have zero escaping up on the list, but I don't know that I have much to say about zero escaping. I think I just put it up there because I thought it was a cool word. Um, what is zero escaping? I don't even know what it is. Oh, zero escaping is when um, so it's spelled X E R O S C A P I N G. Um, it's uh, I think the other like word you would compare it to is landscaping. Um, and so like in Texas, at least landscaping is like when you have a yard and it's green and you have bushes and you have men who come with little gas powered cutting machines once a week and 
uh, cut your lawn and trim the bushes and edge the yard. And that's like landscaping, right? Zeroscaping mm -hmm. is this whole idea that you take out all the green stuff and instead you replace it with rocks and like low water cactus dealy things so that the amount of water and upcave that your yard needs is low. Um, I don't actually know where zero, the, I don't know why it's called zeroscaping, like Z E X E Z R O. Mm -hmm. I mean, zero isn't like zero water. It's supposed to be like more sustainable and more natural and like um, oh. not as, like you don't need fertilizer or like um, pesticides to keep the weeds out because you're not trying to like maintain a lawn. So it's like basically like anti-lawn movement um, is zeroscaping. One of my neighbors next door has their yard zeroscaped. It looks good. So it sounds like it's basically uh, desert aesthetic, uh, sort of eco-friendly desert version of landscaping. And if I zero means the same thing as in zerography, it would mean light. So light as in like, you know, illumination landscaping, if it means the same thing, because that's what the Greek um, prefix zero means, light. I have to look it up, actually. Here, let me type some things into the hmm. computer and see what... I'm worried I got it. Maybe I spelled it wrong. Oh, I did spell it wrong. It's, it's <laughs> but it still starts with X. It has an I in it instead of an O. Yeah, it's, it's basically, so according to Wikipedia, the first sentence says it reduces or eliminates the need for supplemental water from irrigation. Wait, how is it spelled? X-E-N-O or X-E-R-O or what's it, what is it? X-E-R-I-S-E-A-P-I-N-G. Oh, okay, so more zero scaping, not zero. Okay. It says Denver Water coined the term in 1981 by combining land landscape with the Greek prefix zero or X-E-R-O meaning dry. Oh, I might have gotten my etymology of xerography wrong then. Yes, I think I got it wrong. It's not writing with light, it's dry writing because the printing processes before then were wet, right? Wet ink based yeah. processes. Okay, so totally my, uh, me getting it wrong. So xerography is dry writing, not light writing. Oh. <sighs> I've been gone from Xerox too long, or too long, <laughs> and too long. Good, we can All shine right. some light on this dry problem. Um, sorry. Okay, so that's useful. I got a etymology correction. Okay, yeah. so it's dry landscaping and dry writing. Right, or like reduce water consumption. The idea is that you make your garden look nice and beautiful without having to water lawn all the time. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, waste pollution. It's supposed to be like eco-friendly, eco-friendly lawning. Do you have a yard with your townhouse? No, okay. So you you can't do outdoor stuff. I have like I do have some rocks. I planted some milkweed and some uh, wandering Jews um, out front. Which okay, is, so you have some land. Yeah, I have like I have like a little bee strip. <laughs> Like okay. one little thing, and I put my garbage bins on most of it. So, <laughs> uh. um, I tried to put some like bushes in, so it kind of would cover up the fact from the street that I've got big garbage bins. But I didn't pick the right thing, and it, still looks, it all looks terrible. It's fine. I'm gonna fix it later. Um, I think we have in our balcony maybe I don't know six feet by one foot of like space for uh, oh. plants and pots. Uh, if I yeah, because most of the space is occupied by the balcony chairs. So we have like three or four pots and a bunch of succulents that we're trying to give away, but a couple of like kitchen plants. I, okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any. I have like one kitchen plant. She lives on the balcony though. It's a, I have a kefir lime tree. You said she. Is it one of those plants that has genders? Like papaya has genders, I know. Like oh, I don't know. I decided, I decided I wanted it to be a she. Um, I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a kefir lime tree, which you're supposed to be able to use the leaves in like Thai uh -huh. soup. I think I've used it like once, but I like having it mostly because like it wasn't very healthy for a long time. And so I didn't have a lot of leaves. I didn't like take leaves off to make soup with it until it was like, okay. Uh -huh. But that was like three years ago now. So like, I still have this like cute little tree that like is finally, like I trimmed it a few weeks ago and it's like, like it burst out all these, it's like very happy right now. I'm finally somewhere hot though. I think it likes the hot, lots of oh, fun. Okay. Oh, so um, you brought it from San Francisco. You transported this tree. Yeah, I had brought it from SF. And in SF, it was an indoor plant. I had a really sunny room that I had it in, but it was indoors and it kind of had bugs and stuff. But I put it outside and like, I think it's finally like, oh, this is great. It's hot. Like, 
Blood yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, it's a citrus, so SF is not exactly a citrus friendly latitude, is it? I guess not, but a lot of people have fruit trees there. Hmm. I guess they also have like apricot trees. I guess those aren't citruses. There's some citruses. Yeah. I think apricots are more northerly latitude plants, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know much about fruit. Lemon trees are popular in SF, I think. Oh, they are? Okay. That's it. Yeah, I don't know. Exactly. Hmm. Make some stuff up. Cool. Should we talk about one more thing? All right. One more thing. What's the next X? Uh, the next thing we have up is X for unknowns. Like the X, like in math, when you have an X in the equation, it usually is like hmm. the quantity. Usually it means the quantity you're solving for, right? Um, but it's kind of like an abstraction, like a, a way that you can, I don't know, like equations are cool, right? Because they're supposed to be models that you can like plug things into. So like you like, yeah. X is cool. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh no, I'm gonna. Ah. <coughs> um, hang on, let me take a sip of this. Like... So X, I think is kind of interesting because it's like the zero, like it was a symbol that had to be invented at some point in the evolution of math. Like, you know, zero became like a thing to make explicit when you had to do uh, power arithmetic basically. Uh, mm -hmm. place value arithmetic and uh, that moved math along and uh, x at some point was like at some point you needed to represent things you didn't know and i forget i, I don't know who first thought of putting x into equations for that purpose but um like uh, i do know that is it uh, for things that you don't know or is it for things that can change uh i think uh, both right uh, like uh, yeah. in algebra you know a standard like static quadratic equation it's it's an unknown value You've, Solve the equation, you get x. But it's not. But it, it's not yeah, in algebra it is, right? Yeah, but it's, in other like differential equations, x can be solved. The result might be a curve or something, right? Like you know. But I guess x, my point. But, but my point more is that like when you draw a graph, x stands for the thing that changes. Like so, when you write like the equation. Oh, that's like, a different yeah. use of x, right? That's coordinate geometry, like Cartesian coordinate geometry, x-axis, y-axis. I'm thinking more like x plus y. Programming. Yeah, uh, but these are different. I think these are distinct uses of the unknown symbol. Uh, or like, you know, if I give you the equation x plus five equal to seven and you solve it and come up with x equal to two, that's like an algebraic equation. That's not a graph, but uh, oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah. There's two different places that you can use it, right? One is a notation for like this value is changeable. So like you can build a structure and you can leave x there as like a, as the, um, not as the unknown, but as the, the variable that changes. And yeah, so you can and they, you can a, translate the between them, right? Like you can take the equation I just said, like you know, x plus five equal to seven, and move mm -hmm. the seven over and say x minus two equal to zero. But then you can call it x minus two equal to y and plot the y x graph, and then at the point where y equal to zero, you solve the value of x, right? So that's the relationship right. between the graphing version and the static um, unknown value version. The only, but the unknown value version only comes in when you add in like an equal sign, right? Without the yeah. equal sign, x can be like is unbounded, so there's nothing to solve for. It's just a representation of like no. the fact that like a relationship between the other aspects of the equation. No, yeah, why well, is? I mean, it's an equation with a single variable, and an equation has an equal sign, so it'll solve for either one or two or whatever number depending on the order, right? So yeah, quadratic yeah. will have two answers. Um, Third order yeah, equation will learn three. But that's only if you put in an equal sign. Yeah, but that's one of the ways you use an X in equations where <laughs> there's an equal sign, right? Right. Right. And I'm talking about the other way you use X's is the ways to define variable processes where the like as an input, like it's the it's an input oh, yeah. denotation. Uh, so you can build a I, I, I don't know why we're arguing about this. There are both ways of using a symbol X. <laughs> I don't feel like we're arguing. This does not feel like an argument. I feel like uh, me attempting to explain to you how my way of like looking at it is also correct. No, exactly. I, I'm not denying that. Uh, but it is interesting that at some point somebody realized that it's actually important to have a symbol for this because I was reading actually some history on uh, uh, ancient Indian mathematics. Like, you know, the same period that the zero was invented, they were also doing a lot of uh, algebra in India, hmm. but they didn't use symbols like X they would like have these elaborate word problems of uh, with like you know colors and descriptors 
and it would be like um, I should like find my book and read out the description. It's really weird. Like they managed to state really complex algebra problems without ever actually creating a symbol for the unknown they're solving for. Yeah. And that right. tells and me like, that. Right. This is my theory, but this is my theory about where X came from. I think it's because they were trying to develop a universal truth. And in order to do that, you have to create a relationship a and you need X to re represent like the variable, the changeable thing in that relationship. But the relationship still holds even though it changes. Yeah. The, there's One, still something you're saying that I think that's more than what we've discussed, but I can't quite put my finger on it because uh, once you have the relationship defined then you can then you can solve for things like then the solving part becomes true because you know what the relationship is we have to define the relationship and being able to abstract out that x quantity the x factor abstracting out what is variable and able to change in the equation is all the work is all the work right yeah and it stands for something you don't know and um, it could either be something you don't know that's one specific thing or something you don't know that belongs in a huge space of possibilities, right? So right. Like in an nth order algebraic equation, there are going to be n roots, but in sort of a differential equation, it's going to be a curve with uh, an infinite, you know, x as but a function it's the of place time. marker for the unknown. Like it allows you to box in the unknowable to a certain location and like mm -hmm. put a little box around it, like a little square, x marks the spot. That you exactly. can exactly. Oh yeah, that's another down place down. it might have come from. Like you know, treasure maps, and maybe that's where it came from. Maybe people were marking unknown spots or like where the treasure was buried with an X, and that's how somebody thought, hey, let's use that symbol for math as well, right? And yeah, maybe who knows? Yeah. And then I there's like the X files. Uh, what else uh, fits that sort of I don't know connotations oh, of X as an unknown? X files is one of my favorite shows. Did you ever watch it? The no. X files. I think um, this is a kind of generational difference. It was um, the millennials I were. I had friends that were really into it. I just, I grew up with really conservative parents, so we weren't allowed to watch very much TV outside of like three or four set shows. Um, so I watched Gilmore Girls, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, maybe some like superhero y thing, whatever was on like WB39, which was like the thing when I was in high school, like we were allowed to watch. And that was like it. Uh, that's kind of funny. <laughs> Might explain some of my media consumption habits. Um, yes, it does. Uh, but yeah, X Files was kind of good. I, I recently tried rewatching, and it's kind of still fun. But it's so weird to watch it in the age of the internet when there's like conspiracy theories all over the web, and this is like a show about like alien conspiracies and things like that. But before the web, and you know, it's like how how could you even be a conspiracy theorist without the internet to help you be one? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, there's a lot of things I have this thought about, though, lately. Like, what was the thing I was thinking about the other day? I can't remember. But yeah, like, every once in a while, you come across something like, how did that work before the internet? Like, <laughs> I don't know. At one point in, in college, I took a STS course, which stands for Science Technology Society. Um, it was like a, up in back in, this was in like 2008. So it was like a new and hot upcoming, like new academic, like uh, mm -hmm. I think it was fairly new academic, like concentration then. So the fact that I could take a class and it was pretty exciting. Um, and uh, one of the things we did was like, she had us, I can't remember, we had to do like some big project on something. And one of my like classmates decided to do how were like parties organized in college before the internet? Cause like we all had Facebook. So if you want to have a party, you just put a thing up on Facebook and people showed up, it was great. Um, <laughs> But that was like how you told people about it. And so he went around and like called all his parents and like found out about like fascinating things like bulletin boards and um, like phone trees, like like flyers, printing up flyers, handing out flyers. And I was like, can you imagine getting a flyer and going to a party based on a flyer you got? Like, I guess people think the same thing about seeing stuff yeah. on the internet. Yeah, I mean, that's not so long ago. Like if you look, if you watch 80s movies like Revenge of the Nerds or something, you kind of, you have scenes yeah. like that, like people going around putting up flyers for uh, parties and yeah. stuff. But would you go to a party based off a flyer you saw? Apparently people did, like. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think uh, when I was, yeah, when I was in college, um, that's how you put up announcements for events. Like each hostel had like a, 
notice board where people would put up flyers. If you wanted to host an event at your hostel where you wanted other hostels to show up, you'd go to all of them and like put a flyer on sort of a column or a bulletin board. So And people would show up, right? Yeah. So it's that's, that's, that's I think that's the part of the league is incredible to me. And like people would just show up. Okay. Now it feels like I'm an ancient uh, cave person and you're from like the millennial internet future because yeah, now that I think of it, I did I think I'm part of the tail end of the generation that organized events without the internet. Yeah, you just because... put up papers like Mad Men, like, and people would <laughs> go. Like, you'd go read the board with the paper and then go to where it told you to go to. Like, you couldn't phone home if something went bad. I don't know, man. Like, uh, yeah, we used to like hunt dinosaurs and put up flyers and things. It, it was a wild time. Like, un speaking of unknowns, like that, you know, it's the X factor of like, who knows what you're going to get when you show up with a flyer set. That, oh, yeah. That, that, that's another connotation of X, right? Like the show X factor when people say that somebody has talent, like, you know, a musician or somebody who might be technically perfect and stuff. But if you don't have that X factor where you kind of pop and something intangible makes you like a potential future star. So yeah. that's kind of what, like, I don't know, media talent people seem to mean by the X factor where some. I'm thinking of actually, uh, there was a famous Italian painter who was, uh, do you know the poem which has lines that go, uh, for a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's, uh, uh, or what's a heaven for? I think it's something called Andrea Barto or something like that. It's, uh, so the name of the poem is uh, something called Andrea Barto. And it's about this Italian painter who was in his time known for being like an absolutely technically perfect like um, artist. Like, and he, he, he could like beautifully execute on like all kinds of like uh, artworks, but he never became famous like his contemporaries, like, you know, Da Vinci and others were like, and in Gunaleshi and all those uh, famous early Renaissance Italian artists. And this poem is about the fact that this guy's technical perfection was in fact the reason that um, he never actually became like historically famous and it's about like you know you kind of need that x factor you need that something in your work that sort of reaches out beyond what it already masters so there's got to be the sort of i don't know instability and x factor to it so uh, it's a, it just it didn't have he was like very good at making technically great perfect things but it didn't have like the je ne sais quoi of yeah. um exactly yes so to yeah. speak so, you know my so my friend who's been getting me into myers-briggs would call that the difference between an n and an s painter <laughs> hey, um, i'll buy that i'm an n so i'll totally take that kind of flattery <laughs> uh, sometimes you know i think myers-briggs is entirely about flattering the nts like Nobody else comes off looking very good in the Myers Briggs, but the NTs look good. The NT or the N? Yeah. So. Oh, really? Oh. I mean, I don't know if I think that. The okay. others kind of. I don't know. <laughs> At least to me, maybe I'm very self-centered, but the others. I, was say, I mean, you look. feel. I, what I'm hearing is you feel flattered by it, Venkat. I find the description of NT archetypes kind of flattering, and the descriptions of all the others kind of like cringe. Yeah, that's because that's what you are. You fit into the thing and you like self-identify and that's where like... No, the, uh, I think an anti-person invented the scheme. Like if you went back to actual like, you know, Isabel oh, Myers so and did. Briggs, are there yeah. anti people? Okay, so I was actually looking at this yesterday, believe it or not. Um, the, there is a, it was a wife and daughter team. Yeah. The mother, I could not find her, her Myers-Briggs thing. I'm going to keep looking. The daughter was an INFP. And she got hey. married. The story is that she got married to a man who she brought home to her mom, and her mom's like, "This man is not like us." <laughs> and like she was like, and that was kind of like the thing because they've been talking about it for a long time. But the thing that kind of like motivated someone in this like pair, mother daughter pair, to like actually start putting things down and like codifying it was meeting his her, like basically the daughter's husband or now like you know he and he was an istj so he was not an n or a p um yeah you're probably right that i'm sort of because i'm an nt i kind of see it as flattering but i do think the scheme itself but it's like you know 16 categories and like logical relationships 
it's a very anti kind of way of like modeling. Oh, like if it's you look, an end, it's totally an end. Yes, it's an anti way of looking at the world. 100%. Like if you compare to like the Enneagram, for example. So the Enneagram to me has a much more sort of mystic occult kind of feel. Or the tarot, I would say, I would call that an SF approach to the same kind of topic, mm-hmm. right? So we yeah. should actually typecast all these themes by their each other, right? What's the tarot reading of Myers Briggs and what's the Myers Briggs reading of tarot? And you know, we should do that mm-hmm. sometime. Like That'd a meta, meta thing. But um, yeah. that's a very anti activity, but yeah, we should definitely <laughs> do it. Sounds great. I'm on, go board. Meta, on the meta. Uh, all right. So anything more on the X Factor? I think we've I think we've uncovered all there is for that one, Bankat. Um huh. you never can uncover everything in the x there's always an x always x (sighs) all right relationships because x defines the relationship man oh yeah that's one of your other topics right so so somebody x somebody so you and i are collaborators in this uh, right so lisa x venkat is the podcast collaboration so yeah that's that's i think like the cross product so the x as a multiplier sign i think it comes from that it's not x as unknown it's more the cross product or multiplier. Well, in, in Brazil, they use it for when you're having like a soccer match between two teams. Oh, okay. The way that yeah. they say it, they use it as versus, not as. So it actually confused me a lot. So the first place I came across it was in Brazil as the way that you would denote two teams like versus, like so and so versus so and so. And then when you end up back in like uh, New York City kind of like design culture, design and art culture, you see, they would use it there, but they mean like more collaboration, like multiply, multiplication. So it was, yeah. it took me a second to realize it was not like a versus thing in the art. Huh. I always think of it as like row and column of a matrix, like, you know, dimensions, like when you say three by five or two by four, like dimensions of a board or something, that's mm-hmm. X as a multiplier and it gives you sort of the product rectangle. And if you think mm-hmm. in terms of matrices, then it's like row and column. So I think of X in that sense as like a, it's the cross, right? It's the cross of a row and a column is an X. So that's another way you get an X. So there's a lot of places yeah. X kind of becomes a symbol. Like X marks the spot, X is a row and column, and somehow yeah. X is an algebraic unknown. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think we've beaten that to death. I think we've beaten it. We've beaten it. Yes. <laughs> to death. <laughs> We, yes, but I don't want to say that exactly. I don't know, man. Okay. <laughs> All right. I should, I should right. run off. Um, but it's good chatting as always. Chatting? Um, yes. See you next week for our second, almost the end of season one is almost upon us. We got two more episodes. So Y and Z, right. Next time we will talk about the Ys. More episodes. All right. Stay tuned. All right, Bankat. Always a pleasure. I'll talk to you later. Always a pleasure, Lisa. Next week. Bye. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one-hitters. Check out their next-generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. We're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.